Okay, I'm going to try and uh, give you a little bit of an overview about the coal operations. Assuming I can do this. There we go. So the, the theme, I think, of uh, my talk is going to be focused on today and prepared for tomorrow, which I think in this current cycle is actually quite an appropriate framework for coal. I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the efficiency side, our cost side, and then just our, uh, our growth potential. Uh, starting out with a bit of an overview of safety and some context. Um, Ian talked quite a bit uh, earlier about the, the uh, five-year plan, and certainly coal, uh, what we've been doing within the safety uh, strategy has, has been to engage in that five-year plan on a number of different uh, strategies. So courageous safety leadership was something that, that coal was engaged in back in 2005, continues to be. Uh, there's another sort of effort being made towards evaluating other cultural type uh, programs like Just Culture. Take 5 was a recent initiative that we had in place that uh, I'll talk about here in a second, but it also has, has an, a, a cultural aspect to it as well as a uh, technical aspect. And then on the fit for work strategy, uh, the drug and alcohol testing protocol that we established in coal about two years ago now has actually been quite successful. We're seeing a tremendous uh, uptake of that within, within the organization, so that's gone quite well. And as Ian mentioned as well, fatigue management was being some of the technical sides of that, the, uh, the instrumentation that helps monitor fatigue is being pioneered within the coal business unit as well. On the uh, high potential risk strategy side, um, certainly we've taken on some key risks for us and not the least of which obviously is the interaction of light vehicles within a mine site with heavy, heavy equipment. You've got haul trucks around a pit that weigh over a million pounds versus uh, pickups that weigh maybe 4,000, 5,000 pounds. So that's obviously a very large risk for us and one that we've spent a tremendous amount of time and effort to put in both uh, uh, cultural type controls, so that's engaging employees on proper behavior around that kind of equipment, as well as, as uh, technical controls like collision avoidance and, and uh, things like that can, that can help reduce that risk. So seeing very good uh, success so far around that initiative. And then the Take 5 was a, a personal field level risk assessment strategy that we implemented here this year. And what was actually uh, pretty interesting about that was it was something that the employees themselves, the unions were engaged in, our safety people. Um, we had representatives from across the company that got together to, to put this uh, package, I guess, or this program together. And because of that engagement, we've had tremendously good uptake as far as the actual application of it in the field. So, we see that as another way of enhancing our risk assessment strategies. I think the best way, you know, when you do all these things, you really do have to look at what the metrics are that tell you whether you're headed in the right direction or not. And I've shown a graph on the bottom left here that's just really the, the uh, high potential incident frequency. So that's any incident that had the potential to result in a serious injury or a fatality. And if you just at a glance, when you look at that graph, you're seeing, and we're seeing fewer and fewer of those type of incidents occurring within the operations. And the more we reduce that, that, uh, that risk, uh, the less chance there'll be of somebody actually being seriously hurt. So this is an extremely important metric for us and one that we track uh, consistently. Uh, real quick, I think most people are familiar with where the coal operations are. Uh, the largest uh, block of our assets are in southeastern British Columbia. Uh, you'll see that little cutout on the bottom right. We've got Fording River at the north part, Green Hills, Lion Creek, Elkview, and then Coal Mountain. So those are the five of the six operations. They're serviced by CP Rail to the coast. And then just on the Alberta side, uh, just west of Edmonton, is Cardinal River. And they're serviced by CN, both to uh, the Ridley Port or Neptune West Shore. And then Quintet, obviously, is the, uh, the operation that's in care and maintenance right now. And so that pretty much frames the, the logistics side and where all our operations are located. Um, again, I think you're quite familiar with this. We've got a very strong resource position. Uh, on the reserve side, that's about 38 years, a billion tons of, of clean coal that's available to us at our current levels. Uh, there's about 3.6 billion as well on top of that that's measured and indicated. And then obviously inferred uh, resources, another couple billion in there. So. We've got over 100 years of mining and 38 years that it's well-defined, uh, very, very strong resource base, almost 100% of it, 97% of it is metallurgical coal. So that's what supports the business. 
I'll just speak a little bit about uh, some of the operational aspects. Uh, I've shown three different measures here, truck productivity, all in site costs and safety. And I think what's important to recognize is truck productivity for us, and I'm gonna speak about this in a second in a little more detail, is obviously a key business driver. And we've seen a 20% increase in our productivity over the last four years, which speaks to the effort that's been made to try to improve the efficiency in our operations. That's helped reduce costs, or all in site costs, as, as Ian had pointed out, have come down 9%. And I think as important as those metrics, the fact that we've been doing that and making a substantial improvement to our safety performance is, uh, is extremely important to the business unit, obviously. Our, our incidents in coal are down 56%. And so that's, that's a tremendously important uh, aspect to seeing the balance across that effort in our, in our business unit. So I wanted to talk just for a few minutes about what actually matters in coal when you, when you uh, look beyond the, the core values of safety and sustainability. And I'm just throwing out a few numbers for you just to kind of uh, put this in context. So we move about 300 uh, million bank cubic meters. So that's close to a billion uh, metric tons of material every year. Uh, we spend about $6 a BCM on that, or roughly $2 billion. And really it's the mine maintenance costs in coal that dominate that spend, so it's about 75%, and roughly half of that is hauling. So you can imagine how important hauling is to us. So important that we focus on the actual seconds within a cycle. So I, I wanted to kind of show you this, ju again, just as a way to illustrate, but Ian had mentioned that we use Wenko, which is a truck dispatch system at all our operations. We track every piece of equipment in the mine down to the second that it runs. And one of the aspects of a truck haul is just that period of time a truck's not actually moving. So this would be when it's being loaded, waiting to be loaded, um, all these different things. So you kind of see that on that graph on the right-hand side, just a breakdown of that cycle. Things that we have control over are things like queue time, how long a truck waits at a shovel, dump uh, waiting time, how long it actually waits to, to drop the uh, material. Um, spot time, that's something that's a skill, so we try to reduce that. When you add all that up, we've actually moved from uh, 6.7 minutes down to 5.3 minutes. And that doesn't seem like a lot, 84 whole seconds, but if you look at that purely in terms of cost savings, that's $40 million a year in annual savings for that 84 seconds. If you look at it in terms of the coal or the extra revenue we can generate and have generated, that's another close to $300 million in revenue. So that's how critical it is to our business that we, that we look at the seconds around truck productivity. So again, that, that will frame much of the effort that we continue to, uh, to make in coal. On the cost reduction side, uh, same graph you saw earlier, we were down about 9% uh, in the last four years. And that's made up of a number of different components, uh, particularly the ones that we have the most control over are things like the use of contractors, consultants. Uh, we did use some contract mining. Those are the largest blocks you'll see in that waterfall graph that have been reduced. Strip ratio haul distance can go up or down. It kind of works within a range depending on the mine plan. Um, obviously, diesel was a, a, a larger issue for us over the last three years. It's, uh, it's been a bit of a benefit right now. Clearly, we've made reductions in labor. Um, that's despite increases in contract, uh, or not contract, but our CBA type uh, labor agreements. So there's been increases in, in wages, but we've had a net reduction in number of people. Um, so all that adds up to a substantial reduction in our all-in-site costs. This is really a breakdown for coal. It's, uh, it's just the component that we represent within the graph that Ian showed you. Um, obviously, the same three dominate the top. We've made uh, substantial reductions in the number of people we require to support the operations. Our mine productivities have come up uh, quite a bit, both as a result of reduced people as well as the increase in truck productivity. And we've managed to reduce our contractor and consultant use, at the same time reducing the number of uh, employees as well. So we've made substantial gains in terms of those cost improvements. And then there are a number of other smaller, but they all add up, uh, cost improvements like the idling policy that uh, Ian mentioned earlier as well. So for us in coal, that's about $334 million in annualized savings. About $200 million of that was from 13, about another 134 roughly uh, for 2014. and then. Our portion of the 100 million is about 40 million dollars that we aim to, to uh, reduce this year. So our focus, obviously, one of the critical things about any cost reduction program is that we lock those savings in. They're not, they're not one-time savings necessarily. They're savings that we can enjoy year after year. And so that remains a key focus on cost reduction. 
And our 2015 focus will really continue to be on truck productivity, contractor management, and the maintenance effectiveness, which ultimately helps support the truck productivity side. And as I mentioned, we have an additional 40 million in savings to, to uh, address this year. On the growth side, there's some near-term projects. These are really just extensions of existing operations. So Fording River, we're moving through the swift permitting process. That's all on track. Uh, we plan to release first coal in the fourth quarter of 2016. And that represents about 25 years of mining at Fording River. Elkview, uh, same type of scenario, Baldy Ridge extension, that's on track. We'll see first coal from that in 2018. Green Hills is extending out the north end of their operations, so the Cougar Pit extension. We see first coal in 2017, and then Coal Mountain, and that's the first sort of Greenfields uh, development in a sense. It's uh, a different mining area from Coal Mountain directly. Um, that's on track, expect uh, fourth quarter of 2017 to see coal from there. And that represents the next 20 years of mining for Coal Mountain. Um, we do have a large uh, growth potential, obviously, in the long term. That is exceptionally market dependent. I think Ian spoke quite, quite a bit to that. So Quintet uh, restart would mean about 4 million additional tons to market. And then any one of our larger operations, Elkview, Fording River, Green Hills, they all have the ability to expand their operations if, if the market was, was right and they're capital efficient. So that's a pretty quick run through. Uh, obviously focused on efficiency, continuing to lower costs, and maintaining growth potential. And I guess the one thing before I turn it over to Rael that I'd leave you with is I've been in the coal mining business for 27 years. I've seen many, many cycles. This is, a, this is not uncommon. We're used to this kind of cycle. This is what we're good at, and this is what we'll execute on certainly through 2015 and as long as the cycle's with us. So, Rael? All right, so talking about steelmaking coal markets, um, the, the key points that I will cover today are the good demand that we're seeing in the market uh, led by markets outside of China. Um, oversupply, however, is continuing to put pressure on current prices, and that is generating more cuts in the market and also delaying future projects, which are either being delayed or canceled. Uh, and as, as a result of all that, it could have an impact on future demand supply for steelmaking coal. So going into demand, um, China produced close to half of the crude steel uh, last year in 2014. But the growth in markets outside of China was nearly double what it was in China, led by the Pacific markets, including India. Um, the, the stable growth uh, that, that we're seeing going forward to 2019 is actually outside of the China market. And what we're, seeing, what we're seeing in steel market demand is an increase of around 25 million tons in steel making coal to 2019. Uh, looking at China more specifically, uh, China increased imports from the, uh, the seaborne market a lot since 2009. Um, but when we look at 2014, as most of you are aware, Imports were actually down from the seaborne market somewhere around 12 million tons. So if you look at the, at the chart on the right hand side, the, the story on the utilization, however, is that seaborne steel making coal was only down by about 6 million tons after you factor in the drawdown in port inventories. Going back to the chart on the right-hand side, there is mixed views as to future demand for imported coal into China. There's two consultants forecasting an increase in uh, imports into China, and CRU is forecasting a reduction in demand in China for imported coal in the period 2019. Um, so China has domestic reserves of coking coal. However, they have limited reserves of high-quality, low-sulfur, hard coking coal. 
that has not changed. So the view of the market is, is basically that China will continue to require high-grade, low-sulfur, hard coking coal from the seaborne market going forward, and that is the product that tech produces the majority of. Looking at the rest of the market, the fundamentals are uh, uh, tightening in terms of demand supply. If you look at 2015, uh, CRU's view is indicating that there will be improved market conditions uh, in markets ex China. Um, and that, that's a result of a combination of both uh, increased demand but also reduced supply. So going into supply, uh, 2014 saw a rebalancing of the coal trade um, with US pulling out tonnage from the Pacific market and refocusing on, on the Atlantic market. Australia on their side increased seaborne exports by around 16 million tons, mainly to the Pacific market, but also across other market areas. On the Canadian side, the, the coal production cuts impacted mostly the Pacific market, and we increased our sales into other market areas outside of Asia. So as I mentioned, uh, prices continue to be low, and at those unsustainably low prices, new cuts are continuing to be, to be announced. Um, the chart on the, the left-hand side is showing that about half of the production cuts had been implemented by the end of 2014. So far, there's been over 30 million tons of production cuts announced, as Don mentioned, close to 33 million. And expectations are that production cuts are going to continue being implemented in 2015. Uh, and if we look more closely at what is happening uh, in, in the US, uh, basically US are exporting around 30 million tons on average more than they were exporting in the previous decade. And at a price of $102, Woodmac was estimating that close to half of the production in the States was operating at negative margins. Uh, close to half the hard coking coal exports were at negative margins. China also is having issues uh, with, with the low price levels right now. And estimates are that somewhere around half of that production is currently running below uh, cash cost. Um, and please note that those, those cost curve actually include the measures that the China government announced late last year, earlier this year, to support the domestic producers. Um, the, the view in the market also is that there is not as much room left for producers in China to reduce cost or for government to reduce some of the local fees that have been reduced earlier this year. But the low pricing is not only impacting the, the short term, the existing production, it's also impacting future projects. So this slide shows CRU's forecast potential Australian steelmaking coal production. The red and purple bars are the, the CRU forecasts dated 2011, while the blue and green bars are CRU's forecasts dated 2015. So CRU are forecasting that somewhere around 70 million tons of uh, potential Australian steelmaking coal production uh, will not happen compared to their, their 2011 forecast. Just looking at our sales, um, so you're well aware that coal, Tech Coal is the, the second largest steelmaking uh, seaborne supplier. The majority of our coal is uh, high quality, hard coking coal. 
One key change in our sales portfolio is that we started uh, rebalancing our book about a year and a half ago where we started moving sales out of China and into other market areas. Um, so we're working with customers in those other markets, whether existing or new customers, to move tons in those markets. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, the, China, the, the market outside China is forecast to grow by around 25 million tons by 2019, and we're positioning to take our share of that increase. So in summary, um, we're seeing good demand uh, with stable growth outside of China, around 25 million tons uh, to 2019 for steelmaking seaborne coal. Prices, however, remain at unsustainably low level, uh, and expectations are that more cuts will come, uh, with around half of the, the production, the exports in the US and the production in China operating at negative margins. Uh, and the low prices that we're seeing right now are also impacting those future projects, uh, reducing future projects, and potentially could impact future demand supply balance. Thank you, and we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Lori. Sorry, can we just go back to slide 15? Can you just remind us uh, what was uh, China as a percentage of your sales before you started rebalancing? Sorry, and then, this is not... Yeah, so slide 15, it was just showing you a breakdown of sales. All I wanted to know was just uh, how much was China in your sales mix before you started rebalancing? And what's the target, like where are you trying to get it to? So where we were at with China before was around 30%. Uh, the, at, at the end of 2014, we were around 25%. And depending on demand and growth and success in other markets, and in China also, uh, it's a little bit difficult to give you a precise number for future target. Real, just wondering what do you think the rebound in cook and coal price could get to when it comes, given the latent capacity that's now sitting on top of the market with projects delayed and mines being shut down? How quickly can they come back? And do we rebound to 120 at some point? Mm. Certainly not 150 to 160 anymore. So that's a good question. Um, there's a number of mines that, that have been idled, and a number of those mines are actually idled because reserves are no longer there. Uh, in the current market, no doubt, a lot of the production is, is operating at negative margins. Um, we're expecting to see more cuts yet. Uh, what would the price rebound to? Uh, I would not hazard a guess at, at this point. Hi, uh, or Horst Walker out again with Scotiabank. Um, we've seen the spot price for Met Coal uh, really dip in the last week or two, now about 15 bucks a ton below the Q2 settlement price, so clearly down, more downward pressure on the, the next benchmark. At what point, or I should say, at what coal price would you consider idling some of your higher cost mines if we continue to see this kind of precipitous drop? Yeah, our, our mines are all cash positive right now, and, and they're all cash positive to a, a reasonable amount. So it would have to fall considerably more before we'd be looking at shutting down any assets. So we're still in a strong position from a margin point of view. That makes sense. Um, two questions, um, Daniel McConaughey, Rossport Investments. On your slide on mixed views on the China coke and coal imports, it's a nice uh, graph. What is, I don't get CRU, what are they, what are they um, forecasting here as a dramatic drop? Are they, obviously they're forecasting some major incremental supply from China, is that what that is? Uh, that is probably based on um, 
more domestic production, I would expect, and maybe some rebalancing in uh, the, the pig iron and crude steel ratio. Okay. Second question, just on, the, um, on your curtailments, what is the, of interest to us, what is the net number? So you take the, the curtailments, but you also have some global growth. You know, so if you had a graph here of, of what that is going to be, um, what is that, and is that enough? Um, is that line going to um, be enough to tighten the market? So uh, if, if we look at what happened in, in 2014, uh, Australian production increased around 16 million tons and imports in China decreased around 12 million tons or so. If we just look at the seaborne trade flow, as I mentioned for China, the, there was an inventory drawdown as well, but let, let's leave that out for now. Um, our view, right now is that there is somewhere still around 10 to 15 million tons of additional production cuts that are required over and above what has been announced. Okay. Thank you. Continue with that line of questioning. If you said about half of the announcements haven't actually taken place. If, and let's say even as recently as three weeks ago where coal price was hovering the benchmark around low hundreds, 102. If they haven't actually followed through with the announcement by then, what would make them follow through now? That's a very good question. Uh, I guess it's, it's difficult to answer what other corporations are, are considering. I mean, there, there is no doubt that there is a lot of production that is cash negative at the moment. How much more is it going to take is, is difficult to estimate. Yeah, sorry, just uh, coming back. Um, my question was, at what price would your highest cost mine become free cash flow negative? What coal price? So I think that's a, there is no one price that would make a mine Ready, we'll put a mine down because it's a very complex scenario w that you're into at that stage. There are, there are things, and Ian spoke to, to uh, scenarios where you might adjust a mine plan in the short term to get through to a longer term. Like, there is no, there's no price that I could give you that would say this is when we're going to shut something down. It has to be looked at in the context of all the operations together, the length of time that we think you know, we are in a market towards better pricing. All those factors would enter into a decision like that. So. That's the best I can give you. There is no single price. Hi, guys. Uh, just a co couple of questions. One in, in the market and the other one on the operations. Um, in your sales mix, uh, pricing has been coming from you know, yearly contract to a quarterly contract to spot market. What percentage of your sales are still quarterly contracts as opposed to spot market? So nearly half of our sales in 2014 were still quarterly priced. Uh, if you look at a bit of a chronology around that, um, spot price sales in 2014 were above 55%. Prior to that, in 2013, they were above 40%. Um, and then 30% in 2012, and, and prior to 2012 was about 15 to 25%. So if you look at what has happened in the market, our sales profile has, has followed the, the move to shorter term pricing generally in the steelmaking coal market. Do you think those are going to like two thirds? What's, what's the trend? What is the trend like? And then just you know, one more question on the operations, if I may. So uh, I guess the, the question is, is more about how the market continues to evolve. And I expect if, if we continue to see uh, a movement to shorter term pricing, our sales portfolio will also reflect that. Great. And then just very quick question on the operations. On the Coal Mountain Operation Phase 2, you described this project as a greenfield project. Could you provide us with the, the cost per ton to develop that mine? No, I can't speak to that directly, to be honest. I don't have that number in my head. 
He saying no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, hi, uh, this is Mitesh from FBR again. Uh, just uh, one quick question um, on um, on the some of the uh, inertia which we often see with the coal companies. Um, that even though you are out of the money on an operation, you continue to keep on running it because the cost of idling is potentially outweighing the cost of keeping it running, right? Um, and I know your, your minds are all cash, cash flow positive right now, um, but if I were to think about um, a scenario in which that is not the case, what is that inertia cost, if you were to quantify it, feel free to include take or pays or whatever you need to do, would you like run your mind ten, fifteen dollars below ma uh, below the cash margin, or is it more? Yeah, I'd, I'm going to give you the same answer I gave earlier. I mean, it's such a complex thing, and it would have to be evaluated, you know, really within the context of all of the things that are being impacted. So, whether products that the market requires that we have sales for are there, like there's there's just a there's no good answer for that. Like there's no single simple answer for that. But it's something that obviously you look at con continuously, right? As things evolve. So, fortunately, we're cash positive at all our operations, and we've got strong cost reduction programs in place. And we're actually, pretty confident that we're in good shape right now. Robin, for the four expansion projects that you list on that one slide, would any would those projects in aggregate change the cost structure for the company on a go-forward basis in any material way? or would the overall costs in the coal business stay roughly where they are with those projects online? Yeah, they're gonna stay roughly where they are. Some of those projects may have different mine planning scenarios. They might be slightly higher ratio or slightly longer haul distance, things like that, that will on balance affect the overall costs. But roughly they're not too far off of what we operate at now. I, I'm over here. A lot. A lot of coal companies seem to, sorry, seem to have um, been talking about advances in mixing um, to create like bespoke coals to, to increase their, uh, increase the demand for their coal. Have you seen any impact of that on, on your high quality coal business? 